So welcome everybody. I'm very excited today to be sitting down with Justin and we're going to talk uh, all things, the historical context of URR, the Usui Reiki Ryoho uh, healing method. And we're going to dive into the historical context of Mike Usui and the practice of hands-on healing as we are looking at it from multiple different perspectives here. We have a lot of questions coming in from the URR group itself. I'm very, very excited to be sitting down here with Justin. Justin, welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I really love uh, what you all you do with the uh, Facebook community. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. So, if you want to give yourself a, an introduction and you know let everybody know about the work that you're doing, maybe your historical background, your time in Japan, you know. Sure. Um, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I first started looking into uh, energy healing more broadly uh, from an academic perspective almost 20 years ago. Uh, actually, about 20 years ago, yeah, I, I was doing a uh, undergrad semester abroad in Japan uh, in 1999. Uh, that summer, I had trained in another uh, healing modality called spiritual human yoga. That's a, a chakra-based system. And um, I was practicing this healing, but I was also uh, studying Japanese religion, and I started learning about Japanese new religions. I did healing with the hands, and I started getting interested in that. And um, I was also interested kind of in the commercial aspect of some healing modalities versus others that said it was kind of a, a duty to humanity to practice and to heal. And so that was my first uh, project was a postgraduate. Uh, I got a Watson Fellowship, which allowed me to travel around the world for about a year. Um, that's where I got my first Reiki initiations, uh, levels one and two, um, and level one in India. Level two, actually, I got a distance initiation, um, which I know is kind of controversial, but I was, uh, you know, 22 years old and, and I don't know. Yeah. And so anyway, that, that, was, my, that was my original uh, kind of looking into Reiki and getting involved with Reiki. It was while I was also, uh, you know, studying a number of different other healing methods, uh, doing Qigong, doing um, different kinds of Kundalini yoga. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, and also I got initiated into uh, Jorei, uh, which is another Japanese uh, healing method. So anyway, that was all, you know, my early 20s. I continued practicing for a while. I was living in New York. I was a school teacher. Um, but then I always was kind of like, what if I continued with this research? So I did my master's at the University of Hawaii uh, in Asian religions. And my original project was I wanted to compare Reiki and Jorei but the, my advisor said, it's too much. Uh, you can't do all that with a master's thesis. So I said, okay, there's been a lot written about Joe Ray, actually, from an academic perspective, hardly anything about Reiki. So let's pursue this. And so that kind of, and that was in 2007. And basically since then, I've been studying Japanese, learning about Reiki history. Um, you know, back when I started, there were a few good websites, uh, James Deacon and Rick Rivard and Robert Fuston and uh, Frank Petter's books. Um, but then, and then to Dao Yamaguchi's books, uh, Franz Fina's books. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I think, you know, there was never, um, Hiroshi Doi eventually, um, mm -hmm. but there was never, I was never really satisfied with, um, you know, the context of Usui's time seemed really insufficiently studied and developed. Um, through my doctoral training, I got involved with a research group in Japan led by uh, Yoshinaga Shinichi Sensei, who that's his real specialty or one of his real specialties is about kind of the development of these spiritual healing modalities in the early 20th century, um, their connection with modern Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for my doctoral work, I worked uh, with also the Hawaii Takata archives. I helped organize that. They're now housed at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, I've done a lot of work, not just with Japanese language materials from Japan, but also from Hawaii in the pre-war period. Mm -hmm. um, Takata and Hayashi uh, senseis were teaching in Hawaii in the 1930s. There's a lot of Japanese language materials about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Nishina uh, Masaki has a, a good website where he, he outlines a lot of those. And I've done my own translation of all those articles. I hope to, when I have some time, publish, <laughs> get, a, get a whole <laughs> book of kind of previously untranslated materials on Reiki uh, that I'd like to put out. But yeah, my dissertation uh, is about basically how Reiki 
formed and transformed over the middle decades of the 20th century uh, from in its circulation, its, its development uh, by Usui Mikao and its, its adaptations by Hayashi Chujiro and, and Hawaii Takata um, mm. audiences. And yeah, so that's basically my work so far. And Fantastic. I, uh, hopefully the dissertation will be revised and, and what is, yeah, if, if I get some time this summer, uh, I'm going to resubmit it to uh, University of Hawaii Press, and if everything goes well, hopefully it comes out next year. Fantastic. Yeah. Best of luck for that. I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to jump in here to some of the questions. We have one question here from, uh, these are predominantly coming from the URR group. Um, Karm Dago, I think this is a good, uh, your introduction there kind of alluded to one of these questions where Karm was asking, um, what was practiced before the Mount Kurama uh, experience from a perspective of like hands-on healing and from Mike Usui's perspective, you know, there must have been something going on prior to that. Right. Right. So if there's anything that you can, you can uh, address on that question there. Yeah. See, back yeah. in the days, Reiki healing was not something that only Mike Usui could perform. And there was a many, many other schools and, you know, Usui sensei called it Usui Shiki Roho, right? So, Maybe you can allude to that question, can give some, some guidance on that. Right, okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much I can say. Um, and as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a whole uh, 45 minute lecture about that. Uh, that's gonna be part two of this upcoming webinar I have, uh, but I'll try to do a five minute version of it too. Mm. Uh, so um, it's interesting in, there's basically you know two texts we have that are from, uh, Usui Sensei's time that talk about him and his teachings and his life that are the um, question and answer uh, text in the Hike, the Usui yep. Hike, um, called the uh, Kokai Denju Setsume, or like the, ex the public explanation of practice or something like that. And then, which the Gakkai themselves said was first published in 1922. Um, the earliest edition I've seen is from 28, but um, mm -hmm. it's it's entirely possible it does go back to his own lifetime. Uh, and then there's the stone, you know, at his memorial, yeah. his memorial at his tomb, uh, which is dated 1927. So those, those are the, the early texts we have. Um, because as other uh, people have written from that time, he didn't like advertising and he didn't uh, publish materials for the general public, which is in a stark, contrast with a lot of other therapists from his time. So we do have full books, newspaper articles, newspaper advertisements about other therapists in his time, but he seems to have really focused on um, teaching people maybe more face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he published this kind of brief thing for members of his society. And then there's this stone kind of exhorting, you know, his greatness, um, but from those two texts, we actually have um, a little bit of a different account for the question that you asked. So in his text, the question and answer text, he says, I did not study this with anyone. Uh, I, this is a wholly unique therapy based on the Reiki that is from this like mysterious ability of the cosmos. And, mm -hmm. and he says, you know, every living creature has this ability, but mine was awakened, you know, in the, after doing this fasting on Mount Karama. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm the founder, I can't really explain how it works. I just did this practice on the mountain, I gained these powers, and I've developed this way of giving it to other people. And I wanna share it outside of my own family and you know, kind of inspire others to awaken this power that we all have, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there's this kind of, um, you know, out of yeah. Uh, so so in that account, it's really this like spontaneous thing. But on the memorial stone, it talks about all these other things that Usui Sensei uh, practiced and was interested in and had researched, and it makes a big deal about how he had mastered all these different fields. And among them, including psychology and medicine, the Christian and Buddhist scriptures, uh, history, there's a number of things that seem more on this kind of spiritual practice and mm -hmm. uh, 
um, physiognomy, which is like, you know, kind of, and divination. So it's like telling someone's uh, character from looking at their face, which mm -hmm. actually is something that Takata was said to be very good at as well. Um, divination is specifically a kind, it's kind of like I Ching reading, I think, where you throw sticks. Um, and the art of the, like, immortals was one of them. It's uh, Shin Sen no Ho. So Shin is like Kami, and mm -hmm. Sen is like Senjin, like the, the hermits. So the Shin Sen are like the Taoist immortals. And this is, this is probably the one I'm most interested in. Like, it's not really clear what it is, but it's something that Usui Sensei studied that according to the stone, that's like the way of the immortals, which really to me suggests some kind of internal alchemy, um, you know, Taoist, uh, what they call Nedan, the, the kind of internal Qigong uh, stuff. And there are teachings uh, associated with the, uh, the early Reiki about the Tanden, right below the navel, mm -hmm. that also suggests some kind of uh, knowledge of Qigong or Kiko. Um, and then the other one is about these, um, these kind of magical incantations, uh, which, again, I think, you know, maybe has something to do with the way that we use symbols in Reiki. Um, it's not a direct correlation. Um, the other really interesting thing about the symbols is that there's a very strong correlation, as a number of people have pointed out, with aspects of Mikyo practice, of esoteric Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. yeah which is also practiced by mountain ascetics, the Shugen, Shugendo practice, uh, Shugenja, who are the types of people who would go to Kurama and fast mm -hmm. and do, you know, meditations under a waterfall. And so, yeah, from just the, the stuff on the stone and from what we know of Usui and what we know of the Reiki teachings and the Reiki practices, it does seem that he was involved with some kind of mountain asceticism, which also right is the Taoist immortals, that's a major thing for them, um, and some kind of Mikyo practice, whether through Tendai Buddhism, as some people have suggested, or through Shugendo, which appropriated a lot of Mikyo practices themselves. Yeah, so um, the other question, the other side of the question was about who else was practicing at that time, mm -hmm. and how, why did Usui Sensei feel the need to distinguish his Reiki Ryoho, his Reiki therapy, as like Usui Shiki Reiki Ryoho, Usui style? Yep. And um, part of that was because, yeah, Reiki, the word Reiki was a popular word at that time. There were a number of different therapies that used it uh, most uh, prominently, maybe, around the same time. There was a number that we just don't know a lot about. Um, there's this one, uh, Kawakami Matsuji had a book that came out in 1919, so a few years before Usui started teaching, called Reiki Ryoho to Sono Koka, Reiki Therapy and Its Effects. But it's a very rare book. That they don't have it at the National Diet Library in Japan. It's referred to in other books. So it does seem to be something that was like maybe influential in its time but hasn't really survived very well. Um, there's another guy, Yamada Shinichi, um, who is known as like the father of Japanese osteopathy. Mm -hmm. And he taught a, a prana healing, purana ryoho. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He says in his teaching that um, purana, what, what he's calling prana is like the Japanese word for it would be reiki. Mm -hmm. um, and his purana ryoho kind of gives us another hint at a possible uh, influence on Usui. So there was a American kind of new thought, um, mesmerist, magnetic healer uh, guy named William Walker Atkinson. I don't know if you've come across his name, but he wrote up uh, these books under the name uh, Swami Ramacharaka. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Ramacharaka. And they were translated into Japanese. And in some of those books, they translate prana as reiki and in his teaching as well as in yamada shinichi's teaching as well as in usui sensei's teaching they use um the the not only the hands but also the breath mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the eyes mm -hmm. they have um uh techniques for distant healing distant healing um and so it seems that part of what usui sensei did 
was combine these healing techniques of their time that were, that were popular at that time that were influenced by kind of magnetic healing or mesmeric healing coming from the US, getting translated into Japanese, and combining that with native practices from the esoteric Buddhist tradition, and then also adding the five precepts, which has right. a whole other lineage, and kind of creating this also, I mean, the reju, right? The way of what we call yeah. initiations, which yeah. also seems to have been borrowed from the esoteric Buddhist practice. And so taking all these elements and combining them into not just a healing practice, but a way of empowering your students to progress through these like ranks, um, almost like a martial art, but with this like kind of like Shaktipat type or, you know, this initiation, this like uh, empowerment. Um, that seems to really have been his genius and what distinguished his practice. Oh, and the other thing is the Meiji Emperor poetry, right? That, um, yeah, there was actually a question on that that I can go right into that one very quickly. Paul was asking uh, from the URR group of uh, the more information on the connection between Usui Sensei and the uh, and the emperor. The right. Meiji emperor. Yep. Yeah. So um, it's there's a lot to be said about it, um, but in short, um, it seems the Meiji Emperor was very important in Usui's teachings. Um, mm. It's one of the first things he mentions in the uh, Kokai Denju Setsume. Um, he, he, they, uh, they ask, like, what is Usui Reiki Ryoho? And he's like, first of all, I've studied the Meiji Emperor's teachings. Like, it's like the first thing he says. So it's very clear <laughs> he wants that to be said. And then yeah. Memorial Stone 2, before they have the five precepts, it says something about chanting the Meiji Emperor's teachings, his Ikun, which is the same word they use in both places. And so this was, seems to have been stressed very much by the Gakkai. Um, in the Gakkai's um, handbook as well, um, we know there's a collection of these gyose, these, these waka poetry written by the Meiji Emperor. Unfortunately, he doesn't really go into detail about the importance of them, but he does say that, you know, these chanting practices of the gyose, and the, uh, the gokai, the five precepts, will kind of correct the kokoro, mm -hmm. right? Or the heart and the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and by correcting the kokoro, that seems to make you a better practitioner. And um, he says in a number of times that that's the most important thing. Before you heal the body, you have to heal the kokoro. You have to correct the kokoro. And um, we have a number of writings by um, his student, Eguchi Toshihiro, and then um, Eguchi's students, right? Eguchi starts his own school. He's critical of Usui's high fees. He thinks that it, it costs too much to learn Usui Eki Ryoho. So he starts his own school, and he teams up with this um, guy, Mitsui Koshi. And Mitsui is this, like, ultra-nationalist, you know, far-right, um, figure in who uh, ends up like attacking all these uh, professors for being socialists in 1930s. Um, he's like kind of ultra nationalist. But uh, Mitsui, he's a he's like a poetry scholar, and he loves the Meiji Emperor's poetry. And um, they uh, Eguchi School also really stresses this Meiji Emperor poetry. And so even though they seem to have teamed up after Usui Sensei dies. Um, they talk about in their books, their books go into a lot more detail about this stuff. Um, as I said, the, the, the stuff we have from the Usui Gakkai is very fragmentary. Mm. But in their books, they talk about how if you um, chant this poetry, it kind of brings your consciousness into a fusion with the consciousness of the Meiji Emperor, who remember has been like deified, right? That's right. Yeah. So you're bringing it into a union with the with the universe in many ways, aren't you? You're you're talking about coming into a union with a deity, with the Meiji Emperor. With, with the deity, right? Right. Because that's what I mean. Yeah. So, so and you're, so you're connecting and directly into that Reiki itself. That's kind of the idea by that. You're yeah, I, that's it. the interesting thing about kami, though, is that you know there are these like heavenly kami. 
I guess, well, I mean, it's interesting you say that because I haven't really thought about this, but because the emperor is a descendant of Amaterasu Omikami, right? The sun goddess. Mm. The, um, I haven't really thought about that, but the Tenno, like the, the, the emperor, the, the character Ten is heaven. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And like, the, like, like in the Chinese, right? The son of heaven, right, is the, is the emperor. So yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about that because the, so Uchu, the, the term that's always used in the Usui's writings for the cosmos, um, it, it's really like space. And in esoteric Buddhism, space is associated with the kanji for sky, mm -hmm. also the kanji for emptiness. Right, which is like the classic Buddhist concept. Of course, uh, yeah. But then in Shinto, the heaven, right, has this meaning which is tied with the imperial family. I haven't really thought about that before, but that's a really interesting point. But anyway, the Usui's first dojo in Harajuku was very close to the Meiji shrine. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that this kind of union with the Meiji emperor's consciousness, which is, as you mentioned, a kind of, um, kami worship, in a sense, is something also, in addition to the Gokai, which are more, I think, you know, they, they have a whole bunch of influences, but Gokai itself is a very Buddhist sounding word. It's like five precepts. It's like the lay precepts that lay Buddhists take. Um, but the Gokai, which I guess is more Buddhist, and maybe the Meiji poetry is more Shinto, you could think about it in that way, that the two of them work together to kind of correct your Kokoro Mm -hmm. And that is going to make you a better practitioner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, you know, I find a lot of value in this. This is not a question that anybody's asked, but I think it's, it's kind of coming up here in our discussion. I find a lot of, uh, a lot of value in the kind of nebulousness that we have to speak about with this historical context in a way, like you, like you started here, Justin saying there's, you know, there's the, the, the tomb, the memorial stone, and then there's the, the writings out of the Gakkai. And that's really all we've got from, uh, Usui Sensei, but then if you if we had more guidance, I, I fear that we would fall within this very linear approach. Like it has to be this way, and indeed we need to surrender. Like at the beginning, you were saying so many different paths leading in. You're talking about prana. You're talking about all these other energy healing modalities. If we get lost on any one of those, then we are restricting ourselves, and we're restricting that connection with that kind of universal nothingness in many ways. That universal flow, right? We we label with the ego. And it, we, come, we become defined by the ego. And it, I, all of this is just one grandiose metaphor, it seems to me, to, to your own personal liberation, your own personal uh, depth of the precepts or depth into that passage of letting go, surrendering to expectation. Yeah. And I think it, you know, it, a lot of it is to be realized through, through practice, right? Mm. right? Exactly. Exactly. But, they say, but it's interesting, though. The, the relationship, I guess, between the like, text and experience in Usui's teachings, um, and not just Usui's teachings, but I think this is a, a broader thing, both in Japanese uh, spiritualities and in things like um, affirmations and like the New Thought movement, is that, you know, by repeating a mantra or an affirmation or a poem, right, which on some level is a text, that like you're not supposed to get like too attached to. Mm -hmm. right? On the other hand, the actual recitation of it is said to be a transformative practice, right? And that through um, reciting these texts, right, we're, you're not just supposed to say the words, but you're really supposed to, they say like engrave them on your kokoro or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that there is, but that the mouth and the um, kokoro are linked on some level. And, you know, I guess in, if you want to talk about esoteric Buddhism, right, they, they say that the, you know, it's part of the three mysteries, right? Mm -hmm. The speech, the body, and the mind. But the mind is like something also like kind of cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's interesting. If you chant the, I mean, just looking at the, from the, for the perspective of the groups here that are going to be seeing this talk, if we just look into the precepts themselves, I love that they are in, they're directionless. You know, if, you, if you're looking at them, of course, we're chanting that and we're bringing it in in our meditation practice or our practice of uh, individual Reiki, however people listening to this may be practicing. But by just staying with the precepts themselves, we are ingraining ourselves into a, a path that has direction without having any direction. 
Hmm. You know what I mean? Like we are, we are not having any expectation from that. So we're satisfying both in many ways. Right. And I, I, I really, yeah, I really do appreciate that within the, the practice. Can you speak a bit on to the Gakkai? And can you speak a bit about maybe the historical context of it or maybe your association with it or how, you know, how that looks? Um, I mean, I don't, and could you give me a little more direction with this question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry about that. So the, the question here was, uh, you know, why is the, is the Gakkai itself kind of closed to the outside world? If we see the, uh, on, on Mikio Usui's uh, uh, memorial stone, for instance, the idea is to get this teaching out to as many people as possible. Hmm. That the Gakkai becomes a, a, a closed uh, organization, you know, so there yeah. seems to be some... Yeah, I think, I think it may be that they underwent like a trauma in a way. And there, there is certainly, in the, in the present day Gakkai, um, there is certainly a tension between being very aware that if they don't open up more, that they will die out. Mm. Um, the the membership is older, um, particularly at the higher levels of leadership, and they they are I think very acutely aware that there is a lot of interest internationally in them, um, and that they, they have this kind of opportunity to open up more. And even among like younger Japanese people, like there's a lot of interest in healing and things like that. But at the same time, I think there's also this real fear of dilution and of like losing the kind of serious aspect of their practice, that it's something for them where you advance very slowly, you mm -hmm. have to attend a lot of meetings, Right, it's not like our workshop style of teaching. Right. Um, right. And so unless you're like living in Japan and able to attend meetings regularly, I think there's this like feeling like what's the point, you know, of letting people in. And they have been experimenting with it. I think right now, I think there's about maybe 10 or 15 non-Japanese members. Mm. Um, and they they're, but they still go by... Um, the protocol of you have to be introduced by a member. Um, and I think it's probably something that got instantiated um, at a time when it was maybe a dangerous thing to be a member. Um, sure. Their, their, their leadership, as you probably know, were military people. Yep. And uh, during the American occupation, I think there was a lot of kind of purging of these like secret societies that were seen as kind of emperor worship. So I think yep. I mean, the irony is I think some of the Meiji emperor stuff may have been put in in the 1920s when some of these like things like Omoto were, you know, persecuted by the state. So there, there may have been a thing like, okay, well, let's worship the emperor and then we're going to be safe. But then after the war, worshiping the emperor became this dangerous thing. Yeah, <laughs> so, of course. Yeah. It's kind of this double-edged sword in a way. And so, um, yeah, I think, uh, that might be part of the secrecy is it might be kind of a holdover from times where societies like this may have been like a dangerous thing to be part of and you needed to really trust the people who you told about it. Mm, indeed, indeed. Uh, Justin, earlier in the talk here, you mentioned uh, your webinars that are coming up and uh, prior to the, to the uh, recording of this, we were having a chat uh, and there was a question about the spiritual or physical practice of Reiki. Is it, is it either one of those? And uh, I know you were uh, saying that in one of your upcoming webinars, that's really kind of the focal point. If you can maybe give, answer that question, is Reiki a spiritual or a physical practice, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's, I, I, unless uh, I'm mistaken, I believe that was coming up in your first webinar. Yeah, I'll definitely be touching on that question. But I think, I think what you're thinking about the first webinar is really about the, the Japanese Reiki, the traditional Japanese Reiki, and like the so-called like Western Reiki. Ah, yes, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but, but, and that's, yeah but that's the subject of the first uh, webinar. But you know, the question about the uh, spiritual and physical, um, I mean, I think kind of like my answer for the, the, tr the Japanese and the Western too is like, it's not a clear distinction necessarily, mm. right? And that um, the uh, Usui Sensei himself says in the in the um, in the Hike, he's asked, you know, is this a spiritual technique? And he says, yes, but not only spiritual, also physical. 
So I think um, a lot of the teaching, I think, in his, uh, in those early texts stresses, it treats the tama, the spirit, the kokoro, right, the mind, heart, and the niku, the, the flesh. Mm. And that it kind of, the tree, and it's, I mean, what we would today would call like, you know, body, mind, spirit. Yeah. Uh, but this was, a, you know, a hundred years ago they were talking about this. Right, right, exactly. Can you then allude, can you, can you further dive into the webinar and discuss that? And maybe we can then segue into the uh, translation work that you're doing as well. Sure, yeah, so the webinar, um, thanks, thanks for the question, yeah, is, is a fundraiser for this translation. Oh, I should have brought the book with me. Um, for, Tomi, imagine right here, <laughs> uh, Tomita Kaiji's uh, 1933 book, uh, Reiki to Jinjutsu, um, which I think has a lot of times been translated kind of as a Reiki and humanitarianism. But our translator, um, I think, had a, found a really nice thing. So Jinjutsu, um, is, is really about like the caring arts. Um, a lot of, it comes from, there's an expression, igaku wa jinjutsu da, or something like that. And so it's like, um, medicine is a caring art. And mm. here, the author is saying, reiki is this caring art, this benevolent art. And it's one of the, and it possibly the like most important text about early reiki, pre-war reiki, that hasn't been translated. Um, it's uh, about a 250 page book um, that it's very profound in places. Um, there's a lot of kind of theory about Reiki. There's also a lot of practical stuff, different exercises, meditations, um, applications, uh, kind of exercises to do mm -hmm. uh, to cultivate Reiki and cultivate your sensitivity of your hands um, to be able to find the um the spots you know the sources of disease this is a major thing in early reiki that i think really gets lost on some level um that uh the, the there's a real you know the idea that like reiki will go where it's needed that's not the way it was talked about in pre-war japan or you know in, among takata sensei's early students they they really put a big emphasis on where your hand is is very important to be able mm -hmm. to find the place that's the source of disease effectively and treat that spot is really important to have efficacious treatments, they say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of explanation of how to develop those skills and different exercises you can do to uh, improve your ability. There's also a lot of really wonderful um, kind of testimonial stories of Tomita's own experiences um, with, with uh, Reiki that I think give insight like a lot of them, they're teaching stories. You know, the same way um, that Takata told a lot of stories that aren't necessarily like historical facts, but they right. tell something that's important about being a Reiki practitioner. Um, Tomita includes a lot of stories like that. I think it's a really wonderful book, but at the same time, it's a very difficult book. Um, I was telling you before, even, you know, long time Japanese Reiki practitioners have told me, this is a really important book, but man, there's parts I don't really understand so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yep. so, we've, yep. so we've got this great uh, translator who has uh, a master's in Japanese religion from Otani University in Kyoto, um, totally fluent in Japanese, and he's a professional translator. And so mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, I think a lot of other translations are kind of like, you get a Japanese Reiki student to produce like a rough kind of gloss in English, and then the, the English Reiki master kind of cleans up the language, but it's hard to know what's really lost in that translation. And also, as I mentioned, unless you really study pre-war Japanese, there's a lot of expressions and vocabulary and grammar that have changed over time or that have dropped out. And so um, when I show stuff like this to my, my Japanese friends, they're always like, I need to ask my grandma. Like, I don't, I can't read that. <laughs> and so uh, having Dylan on the project where he has a training in this uh, time period and in this vocabulary, and he's a professional translator, um, he's already finished the first chapter and it's really beautiful. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the subsequent chapters. So we need to pay him in American dollars. Uh, and as, as I'm sure everyone knows, you know, it, it's uh, the US dollars are very strong right now. It's, it, and uh, 
we've had it. We've had one fundraiser already, which which I think got about five thousand dollars, which paid for chapter one. But now we're trying to pay for chapters two, three, and four. So right. to do that, I'm doing this this webinar series, um, and the whole information is on the Reiki Centers of America Facebook page, which I guess we'll put a link to. In yeah, we'll screen. share a link with that here as well when this video is posted. And that has the whole kind of syllabus for the five classes. Um, and the, they are a bit pricey. The, I, I totally recognize that. And not everybody, I think, can enroll in all five. And I totally understand that. Or, you know, it, it, money is tight for a lot of people right now. It's a, it's a terrible, you know, time uh, financial burden for a lot of people right now. And I completely recognize that. Um, if you do want to do some contribution to the project, um, but you don't want to necessarily enroll in a class, um, the Reiki Centers of America is a, a nonprofit organization. It's tax deductible in the U.S. And there's a donate button right on the top of their Facebook page. Any amount, um, basically everything being raised right now is all going to this translation project. Mm. So, uh, and then once that is done, then we're going to have a kind of Kickstarter with the, uh, to get the publication together. And then we'll have some kind of, you know, if you give this amount, you get a copy of the book. Uh, but first thing first, we have to get the text translated. And right, right. Yeah, it's, been, it's been really wonderful working on that project. And, uh, you know, passages in Tomita that I've puzzled over myself and then reading Dylan's explanation and, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Or yeah, no, there's times also there's been like back and forth where he's kind of had a, a rough idea of what it means. But then with my knowledge of Reiki or the other something else, I say, oh, I think it's actually about this. And then together we like have been able to come up with some uh, stuff out of that text that I think neither of us necessarily could have done on our own. So it's been really rewarding to work on that project. Fantastic. Now the webinars, as I, as I recall, are coming up uh, relatively soon. Is that correct? Uh, the first one, so it's going to be the last Sunday of every month uh, for the next yes. five months. So from May yes. to September. So the first one on May 31st is about... Um, Jap Japanese Reiki and Western Reiki and this kind of like diversity of styles and what is at the core of all of them and what differs from one to the other and how much are they, do they resemble the historical Reiki as established by Usui Mikao. Then the second one is going to look specifically at Usui Sensei in his time the third one at Hayashi Sensei and uh, Takata's early training and her early teaching. The fourth one about uh, Takata's later teaching. Um, I've done work on her uh, 1951 tour where she taught the first time she was really teaching broadly in North America mm -hmm. into kind of how it changed in the 70s. And then the last uh, one will be, we're calling it like Unsolved Mysteries of Reiki. And yeah. it, it, it delved into a lot of stuff. And so, um, yeah, I think it's it, the way we're working it is if, if you enroll for the first four, you get the fifth one for free. Okay. So that's yeah. good. Incentive. But if you do, if there is one in particular you want to attend, you're, you're certainly welcome to, uh, to just enroll in one. So yeah, the dates, all the dates and the descriptions are up on the Reiki Centers of America page. And we'll share that through the various groups that we have here to uh, try to drum up interest for that. It's wonderful work that you're doing on that. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Of course. One last question here. Um, I just wanted to leave our viewers with something. One of the questions was, are there any books or uh, sources that you could further suggest, you know, that maybe people can dive into if we're really trying to look for something, maybe from a, a lay perspective as well, right? Maybe something that is not right. super thick, but people are wanting to just, maybe somebody who is new to Reiki, for instance, they really are wanting to tiptoe into the historical context or anything mm -hmm. along those lines that you might be able to recommend. I mean, listen, I, the, every, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is I'm not entirely happy with any book that's out there entirely, but um, a couple that I think are quite good are uh, Masaki Nishina's uh, Reiki East and West or something like that. Um, it's, you can get that on, on Amazon. Uh, it's like a print on demand, even though I'm not a big Amazon fan. I think it's a print on demand thing through Amazon, so I don't think you can get oh, okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, Frank Petter's uh, This Is Reiki, uh, 2012, I think. Even though, uh, uh, Frank, if you're watching, I think it could have been edited a little bit better. I think there's a ton of good information in there. Um, and um, those, I think those books, in terms of the history, the historical development of Reiki, I think those are two of the best. Robert Fuston's book, um, if you're interested, and, and full disclosure, I did work on it a little bit. 
Um, I also think he could have used a little more editing for that book. And I edited it a little bit, but it, it could have used a lot more. Um, but uh, if you're interested in the historical development of Reiki after it leaves Japan, that's probably the best uh, book on the market right now, I think, okay. um, in terms of for a lay perspective. Yoyan Yonker's book as well, it's about 600 pages for someone who really wants to do more of a deep dive. Um, and then also my dissertation is available. I just put it up on my website. Um, so we could put a link to that too. That's about 300 pages. And I think it's a pretty good read. And um, <laughs> it, uh, particularly if you're interested in the, in the early development of Reiki, chapter two. Look at chapter two in my dissertation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what we'll do, uh, we'll come together after the, the chat her. Maybe you can just send me the names of those and then I can put those onto the Facebook group as well for everybody for sure. ease, of, ease of reference. Yeah. Okay, Justin. Well, I just want to stay sensitive of time here. Uh, very, very appreciative of your time and your wisdom and your sharing and the work that you're doing. It's wonderful to meet you here. Uh, thank you for all the support for the URR group. Really do appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you asking me to do this and uh, encouraging people to give to what they can to the Tomita project. And I hope, uh, yeah, we more more collaborations in the future. That's right. Let's see how it all unfolds. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Bruce. Be well. You too.